Gurmil Magatha Kahirli, and I must say at the outset, I hadn't intended speaking on this bill because I like to be more pre prepared and having read the uh, documents, and that proved very difficult. And I, then I read, listened carefully and read the minister's speech, and that's really what um, pushed me to stand up and on the record to say I have the most serious concerns once again in the way legislation has gone through the doll. I have concerns for the staff, I must say, uh, without identifying any staff in relation to the pressure that they're under to produce bills and amendments in the manner that they're being asked to do it. And I have serious concerns about our abilities as TDs to scrutinise legislation. And so then I look at this and I was a little relieved to be told that it was by the Minister and by the uh, Bill's Digest. And again, I suspect the Library and the Bill's Digest is under the most serious pressure. And I don't think that they're in a position to give us comprehensive digests in relation to legislation because, and, and Minister, I say this, really reluctantly because I have found the Bill's Digest to be my greatest source of information and education since I came here, but they're under extraordinary pressure. So I'm told it's a technical bill and then I thought that's okay, I can rely on the Minister, I can rely on the Digest, that the bill is very, very technical, we're told by the Digest, and the primary purpose is to amend Part XA of the Planning and Development Act 2000, which deals with substitute consent, and the existing system is two-part where you go ex parte and the public have no say and then come back at the second part. But at the ex parte st stage, um, significantly enough, that's where exceptional circumstances are laid out. And then at the second stage, where the public has a right to take part, they're not entitled to comment on exceptional circumstances. So I welcome that that's now been streamlined and I welcome that change. Again, that's following a Supreme Court judgment that put the whole thing in perspective once again. And they found that the use of the substitute consent procedure in, needed to comply with EU law, in particular the environmental impact assessment. And it held, and I think it's worth saying it, when the Court of Justice refers to retrospective regularisation as having to remain the exception. So in other words, we should only regularise planning permissions retrospectively on an exceptional basis. And as I said significantly, the public had no say in that definition of what was exceptional uh, circumstances. So it, its justification is that otherwise developers may be incentivized to ignore or disregard the requirements of prior consent of an EIA. In other words, national measures cannot act as an inducement to avoid EIA compliance. Therefore, such regulation must remain the exception rather than the rule. Consequently, the relevant provisions of domestic law cannot permit, allow or facilitate a situation where the obtaining of, as in this jurisdiction, a retention permission becomes in any way standard, typical or routine. So the Supreme Court placed a huge emphasis on the exceptionality test. And another issue decided by them, as I've said, was should the public have the right to know the public were excluded? And the Supreme Court held the evident intention of that part of the Act is to the effect that the leave stage is intended to be carried out without a general right of public input. And they go on to point out that the EU requires that the public are enabled to make submissions in the first stage. Therefore, the Supreme Court found that the Irish legislation was inconsistent with the EIA directive. Now, I go into that because I think it's important always to give a little background or perspective to what is before us as TDs. So once again, we're bringing in emergency legislation following a Supreme Court case. And I welcome, as I said, the changes. What really concerns me, however, is the minister's speech. And he opens, he has... Good, he has six pages in his speech. And what really concerns me is not the bill as such, which I have concerns about in the manner in which it's been pushed, but what he proposes to do at amendment stage. And so, proposed committee stage amendments to the bill. I wish to inform the House of my intention to introduce government amendments as the bill makes its way through the legislative process at committee stage, which amendments relate not only to planning legislation, but to other pieces of legislation under the remit of my department. Now, I 
can imagine the bill's office is under extraordinary pressure, but TDs will not be able to deal with this. We're going to come back really with a whole new bill if these amendments, the government goes with these amendments. Now, Minister, I really would like you to deal with this for me because we have what is described as a technical bill to comply with our obligations under the Supreme Court judgment, becoming an entirely different bill with proposed amendments that are not before us, and we have one week left one week left to deal with this. So let's look at what the amendments they're proposing. Amendments relating to short-term let letting. Ministerial directions regarding statutory plans and related provisions. Flexibility in planning applications, which is a very, very complex and very, very significant area that we need to look at. Flexibility in planning applications. Amendments relating to the judicial uh, review process amendments to the Valuation Act, which I imagine is somewhat technical, and then amendments to the Maritime Act. Now, of those, I have concerns about all of them, but what really jumps off the page for me is amendments to the relation to the judicial review process and the amendments to the Maritime Area Planning Act, which we only passed recently, and now we're going to amend it and the flexibility. Now, I'm going to run out of time in a few minutes, Minister. So I took this time to register my concerns. I really wish that I was going through the bill in detail to say what was good and what was, what was worrying. I can only do it on a sketchy basis. And I'm doing that because the Marine Bill, the Marine uh, Act now, when we were discussing that, we were lambasted by the Taoiseach of this country. There was an extremely important piece of legislation and we needed, and he was fed up and tired, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, because important projects, strategic projects, were being inhibited by opposition. They were more or less his words, and that mantra continues. It continues in relation to judicial review, and I am calling it a mantra and a myth. Yes, of course, we need to resource um, the, the courts and the judges. Yes, of course, we need to look at that, but not with the accompanying propaganda and spin that says projects are being stopped because of public participation. Over and over and over, the Superior Court courts in this country have said that there is a trinity in the planning laws. There's the developer, there's the local authority or board planola, and there's the member of the public, without him, without whom that we can't have a functioning planning system. Every single hurdle in my experience since I was elected in 1999 has been put in the way of people participating in the planning process. They're called objectors, they're demonized. I call them active active citizens who are sufficiently concerned to make their concerns known. And at every stage of the project, of that planning, whatever the planning application, it's extremely difficult for them. And indeed, we brought in a, a restrictive system where if they didn't make an application at the council level, then they couldn't do it at board planola. Then we brought in a fee. And we have this constant myth, and it's repeated by a number of TDs in the Dáil, that we have to stop the various organisations on the ground that are holding up planning permissions. And we completely forget the history to planning in this country, the Mahan Tribunal, which found systemic corruption at every level of the, of the uh, organisations involved in planning, not to mention the very, very, I was going to say picturesque, but very vivid pictures of money passing hands. So here we are, and we're going to come back next week with a brand new bill, really, but we're not going to call it a bill, so we continue to misuse language. In relation to the maritime, I, I want to say that when I spoke on the Maritime Act and when the, the Tisha was very critical, we highlighted, and lots of TDs did, that only 2.13% of Ireland's maritime area is protected. The programme for government commits to meet 10% as soon as practicable and 30% by 2030. We fell short of that. And now we've been told by way of amendment, we're going to have a situation where a developer or um, a company who doesn't have plan and permission can occupy a certain part of the sea pending plan and permission or conditional on plan and permission. So what's happening here all of the time is a bit by bit encroachment 
uh, in relation to public participation and in relation to opening up the seas for development. We have learned nothing from COVID. We've learned nothing for climate change. It is one of our greatest assets. The maritime area, the land covers, is seven times the land mass. This belongs to all of us, and we, this should be part of the solution in a new sustainable world. So I, I object to bringing the amendments in the manner that they're being brought. Market.